right? <laughs> We're live. <laughs> Welcome back. Ayo, ayo. Welcome to your Everyday Rich podcast. Uh, we're your hosts. I'm Jen. I'm Jason. And we bring you everyday conversations. I like to call them everyday couch conversations, living room conversations that started from our couch about money, finances, building your wealth, uh, parenting, navigating cultural, wacky cultural norms, growing up as an Asian Canadian in an immigrant household. And trying to figure, just figure stuff out in, in life right now. And there's a lot of things that we always talk about mm-hmm. and you hear about. We're like, I'm pretty sure someone else is thinking something similar. How many times you sit in the car or we listen to a conversation or we have a conversation and said, that's a good podcast topic. Several times. Many times. And there's some of them I forget. This is a problem. This is really bad where I'm in the car, we're talking I'm like, yeah, it's a good podcast topic, but nobody writes it down. And then we come home and we're like, what did we talk about again? <laughs> well, half the time Jen's sleeping. So the thing is, it's like it's hard for me to dictate to my phone or like write something down. But I think I think I think we need to start using like Siri a little bit better. Yeah, clearly. But uh, no, definitely a um, lot of a lot of lot of interesting ideas come when even just listening to someone else's podcast and we're just like, oh wow, that really went deep. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's funny because like. If you listen back on kind of the beginning of beginning of I guess when we started these started the first few episodes and we kind of talk about this whole idea of this the genesis of your everyday rich, it really started from like just us asking questions to each other and be like, I wonder if other people are really thinking Think, about this. Thinking about the same things. And then when we talked to a few people, it was like, Yeah, we are thinking the same things. Or We're making the same similar observations. Yeah, exactly. And it's 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 very fitting because uh, today's topic is essentially an observation, an observation about a psycho, really a psychological, uh, a psychological observation that we see, and it's actually quite common in um, in investing society, but almost just normal society. It's like this whole phenomenon of herding behavior, but particularly like herding behavior in markets. Right, mm-hmm. this whole concept of like you hear about when something's hot, people are buying into it, whether it's like a fashion trend or it's a hot stock or it's the latest gadget. You know, people are buying in when it's when it's hot, it's going up. Like you got you got to buy, and then the opposite is that people all sell or get fearful and or panic in a bear market. So it's this whole. I hate to say like basically kind of a behavior like sheep, right? Although it just sounds wrong, but I mean, I mean, let's cut to the chase what what it is, right? It's kind of this sheep behavior. But it's driven by like FOMO. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah. Right. Like when you see whether it's a tech gadget, whether it's a hot stock, you're, you're most people, including ourselves, right? We, we get FOMO, right? where we don't want to miss out on something good that might happen or something that's cool that we want as well, right? Yeah, I think if I connect it to like a personal story, I think everyone can relate to this hurting behavior at some point. Like you're all, we're all susceptible to the the pressures of, of, of uh, peer pressures with anything. So, I mean, think back when you were in high school, this herding mentality was essentially you're stronger in a herd, right? You're mm-hmm. you're more you're you are well, better off in a pack than being on alone. And with the pack started doing one thing, like I don't know, smoking cigarettes for an example. Mm-hmm. What what did most what did most of you do? Smoke cigarettes. Smoke cigarettes, or you tried it, or something, right? Or you played hooky, or you did something even whatever, what whatever it is, right? It's kind of like you 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 follow the herd. Yeah. And that that psychology trickles all the way throughout like your grown up adult ages to some degree. Mm-hmm. And it's really, really noticeable when it comes to your money. Yeah. Because it's this huge, like I said, this huge psychological thing. Money's always been psychological. We talk about this a lot. And if you have been trying to understand a bit, get better with your finances and your money and get things straight you know that the psychological piece is like the hardest thing to get over 
in a big piece when you come to herding mentality is really jumping on the bag wagon when you're not really know why. Yeah. And there's no one to fault, right? It's not, you're not, don't, it's nothing really to fault. It's really because you just don't know. And you go back, it's, well, why don't you know? So what are some examples of an investing where herding mentality occurs, I guess? Well, I think the common thing is if you think about like the stock market, right? mm -hmm. it's, it's really one of those th uh, interesting, it's, it's an interesting asset class, which anyone can get into. Like you can basically buy any stock these days, but because it's advertised so well in every media outlet you could think yep. of traditionally it was like the news what was it all what's always playing at the bottom half of cp24 or cnn or bnn the stock tickers the stock tickers you see the green triangle or the, or the red triangle <laughs> yeah. right on the bottom of the ticker yeah. but because it's always flashed in our face and the media sensationalizes all these things yeah it it basically it doesn't give you enough information it just says S and P plummets by two percent, or Dow Jones drops by uh, seven hundred points. Well, those headlines attract eyeballs. Yeah, essentially, right? Or you see Nvidia. What's happening with Nvidia these days? Yeah, shout out to Nvidia, man. NVDA going up by how many percentage? Right, like it's it's and another one. That's that's the thing where like it, in the big picture. If I take the stock market as an example, right? So when you hear about a stock that's basically ripping, okay, it's 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 in a bull trend, and it's just been from a day to day over a course of let's say three four months, it has just been trending higher and higher and higher, and at some point, news outlets catch on or news outlets start talking about it more because. Well, what do you think? The fund managers are talking about it. The retailers are now starting to think about it. And then it gets pushed. Yep. And then what happens? It goes all the way down to the retail investors, people like you and me. And we see, ooh, NVIDIA year over to date up 300%. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're like, ooh, this sounds like a good stock to buy. Yep. And you know what? NVIDIA is a great stock, great leadership. Uh, last quarter, just uh, the earnings came out, like superb, beat earnings estimates. Guidance is good too. But we have to understand, okay, do you think we're too late to this? Because the herding mentality is essentially, well, hey, it's a hot stock right now. Let's jump on. Mm -hmm. And most of the times, this is the thing about the stock market. The stock market is an instrument to essentially make money for large capital invent, uh, investors, mm -hmm. right? Big money. Yeah. And they're rotating their money all the time. By the time you hear about something. It's too late. It's probably on the tail end of that run, right? And we always get into it's like, okay, well, it just keeps, it has to keep going up. Mm -hmm. And we never well, ask ourselves. Is, well, thing is think about supply and demand, right? Yeah. The more you buy, there's demand for it. But then the second people stop buying, what happens? Well, yeah. Well, what do you think? It starts dropping. Yeah. And, and <laughs> at, at, at that time, the big money is already not putting money in already. Yeah. Right. So to think about if, you know, when you buy your stock, when you have, let's say, even a couple million retail investors buy in, it really doesn't move the needle because we're talking about such small Peanuts. quantities, like maybe a hundred yeah. million dollars or whatever in the yeah. hundreds of millions, right? Versus hundreds of billions of dollars that hedge funds and essentially uh, big fund managers have access to. That really moves the needle. But anyways, the whole point is like, you're trying to catch it at a point where I think it's usually too late. And a classic example of that is you jump on into, um, let's say the latest, well, what's the latest news in the last couple of months? So we're recording this as of August, 2023. And I think at the beginning of August, um, there was news of Michael Burry. So if you know, Michael Burry, he's the famous, uh, fun, uh, fund manager who correctly timed the short in 2008. Mm -hmm. So, which went on to make a movie called the big short. Mm 
Mm -hmm. right? So he essentially timed the market, said, this fucking shit is falling to the ground. His bet also recently was he put a $1.6 billion bet against the market and he's betting that it would fall. Now, here's the thing. By the time it makes news, it's probably too late. And here's why. Is regulations require <coughs> that big fed... Sorry about that. You good? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, like it's the fund managers, like big, big capital, big, big money like this is required to um, make their trades public, right? On a certain threshold. So, but what's not required is when they made the trade, right? The exact time. Mm -hmm. And they don't need to essentially indicate when are they exiting, Right. So by the time they file, when, by the time they make the filing, this could have been a month ago. So way too late. Yeah. And here's the thing is that you don't know what, you don't know what Michael Burry's exit is. You don't know what his target is. So when's he planning holding? How long is this? <coughs> right. And you don't know his timeline. So by the time you hear this on CNN and saying, oh, Michael Burry's make, betting that the market's going to drop, don't necessarily do exactly what you hear on the news right so what other examples are there of herd behavior in investing this even falls under real estate mm -hmm. and we've noticed oh, it too sure. over the last two years is that obviously we were in a crazy bull run right over the last 12 years but you know since 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 the pandemic the market went on a frenzy right especially in the canadian market and it seemed like you just buy anything it would just keep going up when you have access to media like Instagram and Twitter, which uh, sensationalize things, but really emphasize it things to your feed, right? When you start seeing even, even, you know, we're guilty of this posting, but like, Hey, this real estate is pretty, is, 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 is a solid deal right now. Mm -hmm. You can get caught in that as well, because now you start losing sight. You're using emotions to purchase where you see it almost seems like everyone's buying real estate. Once again, it's another FOMO thing, right? Yeah. If you're missing out, you're like, oh, crap. Well, if this person made 100 grand on this flip or 100 grand just on the buy here, and I, I could make something. Yeah. Right? Why can't I do the same thing? Why can't I do the same thing? Which means, hey, don't all the power to you. You should be looking into it, mm -hmm. right? However, don't let the emotions guide your, your investing principles. And that's that's part of that herd mentality when you just jump onto the bandwagon without really knowing why you're buying it. Yeah. So to our next point is how do you prevent yourself from herd mentality, right? Like an investing standpoint. Yeah. And I think you're, you're, you bring a good point where it's like, we can identify this and it's easy to call it out. Right. Yeah. Right. Cause we, it, I mean, it's always easy to call out something that's obvious after the fact, Yeah. hard to control while you're in that moment. Right? Or it's yourself or it's easy to call. It's easy to see it from the outside, I guess, mm -hmm. when you're, looking at someone else investing or their company investing, but it's when you're the person that's doing it or investing, I guess it's harder to realize, right? It's like self-realization that, okay, am I really investing because of the fundamentals or am I investing because either someone else told me or I saw it on Instagram or, you know, it's influenced by something that's probably not well-researched, right? And that goes, I guess, to what, my f my first suggestion would be how to avoid this would be educate yourself mm -hmm. right first and foremost understand like you got to continuously learn about investing yeah right? if you are interested in the stock market well you should probably start reading literature about the stock market youtube videos there's a lot of good stuff online there's this thing called your everyday rich <laughs> that teach you basically good fundamentals and principles Right. So understanding how the what the market is or what real estate is, what market you should you want to invest in, what asset class of real estate and flipping back to stocks. What stock, what company do you like? Mm -hmm. So it's just educating yourself because being informed really helps you make the best decisions based on information rather than emotions. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. There's not like you cannot have all the information, but yeah. just like in the military, like famous generals, they basically say, I only need 70% of the information 
to make 100% of my decision. Yep. Because you've got to pull the trigger at some point. Yep. I think a big thing would be understanding your time horizon too, right? Because if you're buying something, well, just like anything, like, I mean, just let me, let me look at it like this. Are you buying it for the long term or are you buying it for the short term? And I like using an example of clothing, <laughs> right? And I'm at this point in my life where, you know what? I am picking comfort over style. No shit about it. Like people know, like, yo, I love Costco. I bought that Costco shirt. It was great. But dad I wear. Dad wear. But I don't expect. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hold on a second. I ain't dad wear. I saw a lot of people wearing that and they weren't dads. Are you it, sure? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I fully don't expect that shirt to last 10 years, right? Like, I don't expect it to last long. Who knows? I don't know. But if I'm buying, let's say, uh, like a nice uh, raincoat, uh, what do I call it? Overcoat, mm -hmm. right? Do you remember that overcoat? I always think about this overcoat story. When we went to Japan uh, many, many years ago, eons ago, um, I was really into like the Burberry uh, trench coat. Trench coat. And the thing about the Burberry trench coat, if anyone uh, owns one, owns one, or knows what I'm talking about, like the Burberry trench coat is the epitome of trench coach tr trench coats. It's timeless. It's a timeless piece, but it costs a shitload of money. And for me, I was like, you know, per wear for me, I was I couldn't understand, I couldn't justify it for myself because I'm like, I just I loved how it looked. But when we went to Japan, we tried it on the J Japanese fit just was cut so much nicer because um it was an asian it was an asian cut fit, probably, right yeah. fit a bit more petite frame thinner right things like that so and that's kind of my body type and i was like wow this is so nice and now that i look at it i should have bought it because that thing actually has appreciated in value yep <laughs> and um but the whole thing was that if i was buying that i would have bought that for a long term Right, that's my long term hold because I'm buying one and I'm done. Mm -hmm. and I never would have bought another one because that probably would have lasted years. Yeah, like the stitch quality of the build, everything. But that goes to essentially the same thing. Are are you buying this property for what? Are you flipping it? Flipping it six months? Or are you holding on to five plus ten years? Because mm -hmm. that changes how you look at the actual investment. Yeah, well, it goes back to the fundamentals, right? When you analyze whatever it is you're investing in. One of the key inputs, is it short-term or long-term? Yep. Right? Like that should be a key input in your investing analysis for whatever it is you're investing in. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Um, diversification. I know mean, a lot of people are, this is kind of up for debate. A lot of people say it's diversification, right? Like why would I diversify if I'm concentrating my um, portfolio in a certain asset class to really to jumpstart it? Yeah. I think at certain points in your journey, that makes sense. Uh, I know for us and for myself, that's something that I really focused. I didn't focus on diversification mm -hmm. because it was really like grow your money in a concentrated area and then split that up, right? And and for me, it's kind of like we talked about, like when you talked about earlier, understanding the fundamentals. It's kind of like how much can you possibly, for me, like how much can I possibly learn about that many things to invest in that's true <laughs> that's just me that's my own time right like i'm just not that type of person where i can know everything about everything i just don't have the mental capacity and time to just understand it all yeah. so for me it's kind of picking what i think is most suitable for myself from a risk standpoint from a time horizon standpoint from what i'm comfortable with kind of picking a few right to to invest in, I think. Yeah, and I, I, I like that approach now, especially where kind of where we are too. Like diversification in, in the grand scheme of things helps you mitigate risk, right? Because you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. it, it allows you to ride volatility swings in the market in different sectors. Yeah. And if you study the stock market, and I, I really uh, suggest that you look at history trends of what happens in different cycles, uh, boom and bust, market rotates out of different cycles so when tech is strong what's not strong mm -hmm. it's consumable uh, 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 
diff different areas, right? Um, different sectors, uh, potentially even healthcare or defense that are really in the focus. But when you have a tech bust, what happens? People go into blue chip stocks that are more reliable, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, defensive stocks. So it, it's all about understanding like what's your risk tolerance and the di di diversification can help you, right? So uh, I like I like this one where when we were researching for this, uh, what's emotional control? So how do you uh, control that? How do you control emotional control? Well, it's really emotional. <laughs> it's emotional. It's building your emotional discipline muscle. And this is a hard thing where because we all feel our emotions differently. And for me to kind of tell you how to control your feelings <laughs> is really pointless, but it's something that you have to understand your own, your, how you react to, let's call it volatility. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you see something drop, let's say in the stock market, how do you respond? Or even if you bought a stock or you bought real estate, What's your immediate reaction, right? Mm -hmm. When are you checking your your portfolio every day in the stock market? Uh, when you just closed your house and your tenant messages you, how do you feel at first? And that changes over time, right? I know at first, like when a tenant messaged us for the very first time, my heart was like, oh my God, what's going on? Ten <laughs> tenant emailing me, right? I was like, hey, the tenant just messaged me. It's like, oh, they're just saying, Everything's good, and you know there's a loose door handle or whatever. Phew! <laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> right? My God! Same with stocks, right? Now it's like if I my stock drops like five percent, I'm like, yeah, whatever, mm -hmm. right? So, um, it's just understanding, like thinking of it objectively, how you respond to that type of uh, stimulus. Yep. And really, you can only answer that, right? So, I mean, we'll keep it short there. Um. Last one, I th I believe that I think we all could help avoid herd mentality. You mentioned this word a few times already, Jen. What's that? It's fundamentals. Yeah. And this essentially encompasses all those pieces we talked about. If you develop a sound fundamental investing strategy that is based on fundamentals, that applies to every asset class. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter whether it's stocks, real estate, crypto, baseball cards, paintings, wine, whatever, <laughs> shoes, mm -hmm. right? It's based on fundamentals, supply, demand, Yep. learning when things are undervalued versus overvalued, mm -hmm. right? Yes, there is a timing aspect of it where I think people can say you can time certain things. But majority of the time, you, you can't. You can't. Like your your timing is just coincidental. Yep. Right. But what is what is not coincidental is the fundamental analysis of a company, the fundamental analysis of a real estate holding. Yep. Right. Are you buying a shitty house in a shitty area, or are you buying a great house in an okay area, mm -hmm. or are you buying the best house in a bad area? Up to you. Right, you can decide. Mm -hmm. Does the math work? Does the math work? Is Nvidia worth four ninety five? I don't know. You tell me. That's something that you have to analyze. What that? What that? How much more ramp space they have mm -hmm. to take to continue going? And I think they could keep going, but I also think that they could trap a lot of people at this point. Because yeah. fund managers are looking, it's pretty juicy. You know what? I've made a pretty nice return. I'm going to rotate my money soon. Yep. Um, but I'm riding that wave. Yeah, could. Who knows, right? But it goes back to if you've done your fundamental analysis and you understand what price point you are okay with purchasing and what you're purchasing, when it gets to that point, why are you not pulling the trigger? Right? Mm -hmm. because the herd is telling you, oh, no, it's not a good time to buy. Yeah. 
But you know what? There is that one other thing that I've heard is con- being a contrarian thinker. Because, you know, as, as the saying goes, if you do the opposite of what most people are just doing, you'll probably succeed. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how that thing works. Right? Yeah, right? And you can kind of see if you just take a look back on your own investing or looking at what people did or even your own journey in a lot of things. When people told you not to do something, you did it. What what usually happened? Mm-hmm. Right? Unless you're doing something stupid, but. That depends. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, I talked a lot in this episode, so. What, it's all good. Just from your side, knowing what you know now, what would what would you recommend to help avoid that? I think you said it all. I think the main thing is the fundamentals and like, it's easy to hear a lot of things. You talk to a lot of people, you see social media. There's like a billion things you can invest in. Billion. And it's very easy for people and other people to convince you that, hey, what I'm doing is 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 uh is great. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And it's good to see what other people are doing because that gives you ideas. Yeah. But the key part is just because they're doing it, like go back to your desk, go back to your house and really look at what they're doing. Yep. Right. Do research, talk to another person about the same thing and ask if they're doing the same thing. That kind of stuff. Right. Like it's good to understand what's out there but you know narrow it down to like top five of what you feel comfortable and you understand from top to bottom about how that investing class works Mm -hmm. or asset class works yeah and i think that's it like it's just being disciplined and grounding grounded and just understanding the fundamentals of the specific asset that you are investing in that's the bottom line perfect you know, I want to leave with uh, kind of an example, just the real life example that I've <clears throat> that I've come across and participated in at some point. Uh, like I said, herding mentality is a very strong psychological fi- strong mm-hmm. psychological piece that everyone fights every day, and it goes back to kind of starting in, during pandemic and throughout the last couple of years, where when the stock market frenzy was going nuts, right? People got into a lot of stock trading, options trading, all this thing. Any, anything to do with stocks, it was like the big thing. And Discord channels started becoming a huge thing. So paid Discord channels. And if you don't know what Discord is, think of it as it's a Reddit forum on steroids. Okay. And you essentially join this forum that have you have exclusive access to. And it's a paid, most of these would be paid. And it would be so-called, quote-unquote, stock market gurus. Mm -hmm. And they essentially say, hey, you know what? I made a whole bunch of money doing this. Follow my alerts and you can copy me. Yep. What, do they send you like the top 10 stocks or whatever? They could send you stocks. They send you alerts or whatever. But you know what the thing is? When you're starting out half the time, you probably don't even know what the hell they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's always unfortunate to see people that are jumping on to these communities even though they're they're meant to help educate but really they're there to put money to the person that started the discord channel yeah right when it comes down to it but there's some legit discord channels but where i'm getting to this is that if you just blindly follow like hurt this herd mentality of jump, jumping onto these discord channels and expecting you to make money from someone telling you what to do you'll end up losing money in the long run. Oh, 100%. And the reason why is because you're not, you don't, you're not learning and educating yourself as to why that person chose that, particular thing. chose that trade or chose that stock to invest in, right? Because you're just saying, oh, well, he, he bought it or she bought it. I'm going to buy it too. Yeah. My friend bought it. My coworker bought it. Yeah. They started talking about it. They made money off of it. Yeah. But they made money off of it like last week. Yeah. And I, <laughs> Not yeah and like you know like i've been on both sides of that 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 coin mm-hmm. where i made a shitload of money just blindly following people blindly following discord channels and i've also lost a lot of money blindly following because i didn't understand the trades that they were in mm-hmm. and at some point like you couldn't follow it because you weren't on your phone all day but after you kind of educate yourself that goes back to this whole like learning and understanding okay you know what this is what they were targeting 
This was the strategy they were using. This was their exit, right? This is their stop loss, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. You can make your own decisions. Yeah, you can use their, what I like doing now is you make your own trades, but then you also can look at other people's ideas to give yeah. you some, right? Oh, they're thinking of this trade or they took this trade and you're like, oh, you know what? This is where I would take it. This is what I would do. This is how I'm exiting. Mm -hmm. And if you do it that way, then it can really um, supplement uh, you know, that, that process. Mm -hmm. And it's just like anything, right? Like you're copying someone, but understand why you're copying them for, as yep. opposed to that blind herd mentality FOMO. Yep. Anyways, I thought to keep it real, keep it hunted. Alrighty. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of basic herd mentality and, you know, it's, it's tough, but you know what? I think we can all work on that. We're always continuously improving ourselves. And that's why we want to share this particular conversation with you because we all suffer from it. We've yeah. suffered. We continue to always battle it every day, every day, every day. Um, but as you work that muscle more and more and you become more disciplined on it, you'll understand exactly what you should and shouldn't do. So keep trying, um, work that muscle. And it starts with having these conversations just like we're doing right now with you. Um, so that, you know, you're not afraid to basically when those moments come up, you know what to do. When those opportunities come yeah, up. When yeah. When the opportunities come up. Right. And yep. when, when the next cryptocurrency comes out, you're not just blindly putting in money in <laughs> or an NFT mm -hmm. of a, of a monkey that is now worth pennies on the dollar. Anyways. Yeah. I appreciate you uh, staying on here. Uh, listen to us to ramble about this. Um, like share um, with anyone you think uh, could benefit from this. Yeah. But we uh, hope you enjoyed our uh, living room conversation here. Uh, well, you better have. Yeah. If you stayed with us this long. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. Uh, that's enough for now. Uh, till next time, everyone. Signing off. See ya. Peace. The Everyday Rich Podcast is presented solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. Any such information or other material should not be construed as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. It is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a qualified professional.